Hello, it's Ren Presents Time. I'm your host, Ren, and today we continue with the sixth turn of the Shadow Tech Goddess subtitled Cat. And welcome to part four of the book entitled Bella Thouser. This is the final part of the book. We've arrived at last. However, it is also the longest part of the book, so we have that to contend with. Chapter 1, An Old Friend at the Dance. A couple of uh, side notes before we continue with the reading. As I said, this is the final part of the book. However, this part was written long before the initial two parts of the book. As I mentioned previously, I was completely dissatisfied with the character of Kat and how she was developing or not developing as the case may be. I just wasn't happy with her as a character, as a person. I, I, she, had, she was just flat and no fun and not very interesting and those are things you've got to be concerned with when you're trying to create a, a protagonist for a book if someone if someone like that falls flat it's just the rest of the story doesn't work isn't that right kathleen kennedy at lucas films but i digress so i added much later after i'd written most of part four parts one and two to give cats some life I think it was successful, I hope you do too, that Kat is a much more interesting character as is than how she was, and she just wasn't very cool. But she was a full-fledged black cat, and so my, my technique for giving her some character development was to take away most of her black cat powers, all of her knowledge, her her knowledge in using shadow tech and shadow tech is extremely potent when used well in the temple of the exploding head countess sigillus who gets mentioned every so often in this book killed over a hundred thousand warriors inside the temple of the exploding head she did it pretty fast in a confined area even though the temple was monstrously huge still you're still in a limited space black hat shadow tech Females are incredibly potent and can do a lot of damage very quickly, as we see Countess Sigillus killing that many warriors. Cat does not have that knowledge. We took it away from her. But in these chapters coming up here in part four, I've got her swinging Shadow Tech around like a boss. In what comes ahead, obviously, this is part four, Bella Thouser. They're going to be up against Bella Thouser, the demon in blue lights, and they're going to be doing it on her turf in her horror realm that she's creating. I, those two weren't going to live without Kat's shadow tech abilities. Here I am. I've spent the first part of the book getting rid of Kat's knowledge and skills with shadow tech, and now here for the last part, I needed them back. You know, even though I'm the author of this story, even though this is all things I've made up, I still have to conform with the rules and conventions that I myself put into the book. I can't just make something up willy-nilly and then break all the rules I already established. I have got to follow my own rules. I've got to have a sense of decor. Otherwise, the reader will detect that and check out. In this part of the book... My main goal is to give Kat her power back. Another slight ditty that you might find interesting is this part of the book is a patchwork of little scenes and vignettes that were written in other books that I could not find a home for. You have to carefully self-edit yourself when you're writing a book or anything. It could be a screenplay for a film or TV. It doesn't matter. You have to be aware of things like plot, like pacing, and so forth. And sometimes you write things that you really, really like, but they just don't fit in what you're working on or they slow things down unnecessarily or they just spoil the mood or the tone i've written lots of things that i love that were little gems and i had to end up cutting them because they just didn't work here we have part four of the book and there's a few chapters here and there that i wrote initially 
for other books. So I'd had these little sub stories written in other books and couldn't find a place for them. I just they just never worked out, but I really loved them. So I kept moving them to the ends of the stories and then I'd stick them on jump drives and other other things and keep moving them and I, well maybe this story coming up I can use this little piece or maybe in that story I can use it but never could. Here I found a ripe field for these stories and with a little modification I was able to slip them in and I think they worked out well. We'll see what you think. I was ecstatic that I could finally use these little things that I really loved and never had the heart to delete. You probably won't even notice unless I tell you, which I, I'm sure I will, when you come to them. Anyways, let's dig in, shall we? Part 4, Bella Thouser, Chapter 1. An old friend at the dance. Not long after Clovis, Stenstrom wed Cat in a small ceremony in Tyrol, making her the first Countess of Belmont South Tyrol. It wasn't a well-attended affair, as he had withdrawn from League society, and Cat was a social unknown. Just some of his family, many of the cooks from the kitchens whom she had befriended, the post covering the vent aired reporting her name, Alternatively, as Catherine, Catherwold, and Katrine, they couldn't imagine that a brand new countess of a prominent household would have a name as simple as Cat. They did not consummate their marriage for nearly a month after the wedding. Cat, only newly introduced to kissing, knew little of the intricacies of sex, save what Walker had once shared with her. Stenstrom, always a gentleman, wanted to ensure Kat was fully briefed on what was going to be happening between them before proceeding. Kat, sharing his bed, kissing him all night, was eager to try. Kat's rowdy friends, the cooks, had regaled her with all sorts of tawdry stories about their various sexual adventures, all of which she drank up with relish. As with many things, once they finally did get to explore the wonders of making love, Kat was a quick study pulling him nude to the floor where she was most comfortable. Stenstrom had expected Kat to be shy and submissive, following his lead during their intimate encounters. However, such was not the case. She was aggressive and passionate. One of the cooks had filled her ear with the harrowing tales regarding her fondness for tying men up. Impressionable, Kat bound Stenstrom to the bed one night with Shadow Tech and found that she was enthralled with the experience. She bound Stenstrom to everything, to the columns facing the sea, to the marble busts in the empty western halls, to the dinner table, to the great urns in the gardens, whatever she could find. She especially enjoyed binding him to her sister's monuments atop Marion's Hill by the dark of night so that she might share the experience with her sister's spirits. By far her favorite sexual exploit was the bouncing egg, essentially to surround the two of them in a spear of silver tech, like a great egg. Her shadow tech turned to silver shortly after their wedding, and safe within, go over the side of Stenstrom's grand balcony, bounce down the hedges, over the cliffs, and into the churning sea far below, all the while making love in the creamy silver tech filled sphere, the two of them tossing about in unimaginable bliss for hours. Once sated, the egg dissolved, and they would find themselves sometimes floating miles out to sea, where Stenstrom would have to discreetly TK them back to shore and hope they weren't seen. Aside from her eccentric sexual practices, it didn't take Kat long to make a splash with the rest of the Belmont family in a big, schism-forming way. Years earlier, Stenstrom's mother, the late Jubilee, elders rest her soul, the usual toast at dinner time, had designated that a silver gown accented in a sleeveless corset-like bodice of either black or silver should be the standard wear for ladies in the newly minted House of Belmont South Tyrol. All of Stenstrom's 29 sisters, even the feisty Lyra, had observed their mother's design for years, even after her death, all of them laced up tight like silver dolls. Since the house was created after the marriage of Lady Jubilee to Stenstrom's father, Stenstrom the Older, league law dictated that she could not be the first countess of the house. That distinction would go to the first person married to a male heir, making Cat 
the first countess. That foible of law had infuriated Lady Jubilee the whole of her life, and she continually railed against it in Tyrol to anyone who would listen. As part of her estate, she left a lengthy, rambling, and somewhat threatening vid to be viewed by the first countess in the event she was passed away. In the vid, she implored that all the things she had created for the household should be observed and made official by the first countess, especially the silver corseted gown she had designed. She demanded it, Cat watched the vid, saw the smoky, pewter-locked image of Lady Jubilee, and listened to the thinly-veiled threats of curses, assassinations, visitations from the grave, and other repercussions should her wishes not be observed. However, Cat loathed wearing a corset. Her body shape didn't favor a corset. Cat could handle a great deal of pain, could shrug off all manner of discomforts, but she had no tolerance for courses. They reminded her of being buried alive in the atmosphere suit, a particularly reviled memory for her, and one she couldn't bear repeating. She preferred a less restrictive garment that was more like a casual dress than a formal gown. She wanted sleeves to cover her scar, and she didn't favor silver much. Instead, she preferred wearing Marion green. Julie, the bread maker from the kitchens, helped Kat create a simple green dress that she loved. This little dress, created in part by a commoner from the city, was Kat's choice to be the official wear of the house. Stenstrom predicted what was going to happen, and indeed, much of what he thought would happen did happen. Many of his sisters, most of whom were married into other houses and no longer wore the old silver gowns, were nevertheless outraged by the change. Letters flew back and forth. Demands were issued. Threats were made. His eldest sisters, Burla, Wisteria, Antonia, Celesta, and Mooney, were so upset by this development, they came in person to the manor, entourages in tow, prayed at their mother's gravesite for guidance, and demanded Cat wear the proper silver gown as designed by Lady Jubilee. Burla, the eldest and most similar in temperament to their mother, even resurrected an old Tyrol custom, the Revenata. She appeared at the table in the full image of their departed mother. Lady Jubilee, her visage was the same, her normally black hair transformed into pewter lock, cut in her distinctive style, her voice thrown to match their mother's. She even had mother's ubiquitous cigarette smoldering in its stick. All of this was intended to frighten and intimidate Cat, as if Lady Jubilee herself had returned from the grave. They also demanded Cat wash the shadow mark paint off her face and wear her hair in the proper Belmont style. Enough of the shaved temples and lion-like mane. Mother would have none of that were she alive to protest. All five of them swore they would not leave the manor until their demands were satisfied. Coming to Cat's defense were Lyra, Virginia, Embeth, Natalie, Constance, Xantrope, Deneba, Willia, Calamy, and Lucille, all of them arriving at the manor in force with their husbands and children to argue for the countess. The two sides squared off as dinner was served. Lots of pounded fists and pointed fingers at the grand dining table as the two sides argued. All of them, except for Cat, done up in corseted silver like a set of angry candlesticks. Their various heads of black, pewter lock and half pewter lock hair lit like silver and black flames. It was the nearest thing to an in-family riot the household had ever seen. During all of this ruckus, Stenstrom sat and stayed quiet. He could not intervene on her behalf. If Cat failed to assert her authority over his sisters, especially the domineering Revenata Burla, if Cat gave in to her demands, then that would be it. There would be no getting rid of her. For good or for ill, this was Kat's situation to deal with. What could have been a boorish, contentious, and slightly supernatural situation didn't faze Kat in the least. 
After she had heard enough bickering, she tapped her knife against her glass several times, quieting the sisters. All eyes, both hostile and friendly, went to her. Well, I for one am loving having everyone here at the manor. All the people coming and going, all the noise and excitement, all the children playing on the hill, it's just so exciting. Burla, disguised as their dead mother and full Revenata, the eldest sister of all and Stenstrom Sr. by 75 years, cast Cat a caustic glance. This is a serious matter, Countess. You, sitting there at my table in a ridiculous green peasant's gown, is unacceptable, and I shall return to my bloody death before I allow it to continue. Lyra and Virginia shot up, ready to have a full go at Burla, regardless of what she looked like. Cat waved them into silence. This was Cat's moment to either assert her authority as the countess of the house, or to submissively yield to Stenstrom's fierce sisters. Cat spoke, disguising her usual rustic drawl laced with profanity with a regal voice she had copied from the ladies of Tyrol. I get your feelings on the matter. Your mother, the dearly departed Lady Jubilee, would be proud, and I wish I could have met her in the flesh. And what am I, Countess? Burla asked. You're cloaked to look like the late Lady Jubilee. I'll have to ask my husband later what the point of that is. Regardless, I think I have a solution to this problem. It will be fun. Fun? Countess? Burla asked, fuming. And what would that be exactly? G showed me the lovely chalk house the other day. Down there, near the lane. I'm told it's the official Belmont South Tyrol ballroom. The inside is gorgeous. I love the padded wallpaper, the chandeliers, and the open dance floor. I meticulously chose the materials and appointments for the chalk house, Burla said. Everything was fretted over and well thought out, including the choice of house gown. Cat ignored that remark, returning to the subject of the chalk house. A beautiful place. So much room to have a party. She giggled. I'm told the... Chalk House was destroyed once when a demon came to devour G. Burla's lip curled. If you are referring to my son, Stenstrom the Younger, then yes, you are correct. The Sisterhood of Light sent a demon in the guise of a great fish to devour his soul, nearly destroying the Chalk House, the place where I was wed to my beloved husband in the process. I restored it exactly as it was. Burla still referred to herself as Lady Jubilee. Then it'll be perfect. I propose we have a dance competition. A dance-off in the chalk house. We'll hire a couple of bands, get some great food in there, and keep it going. She, who can dance the longest without rest or exiting the floor, may put an end to this argument one way or the other. Burla was indignant. A dance? What nonsense! We shall not settle this issue with a dance. Whoever heard of such a thing? cat would not be deterred. It occurs to me that I am the countess of this household, great Burla, not you. I could simply demand that my redesigned gown be the official design and that's the end of it. And you may return to your manor wearing your mother's face and rage through its halls until the ground shakes. But you are G sisters. All of you are, and I love the lot of you. Let us enjoy each other's company. Let us dance in the lovely chalk house, and when it is over, we will have an end to this matter. Cat's dance had been going on for five days in the chalk house. The grand wooden floor crowded with people swaying to the music, the chandeliers glittering. Four orchestras had been hired, each taking over from the other after playing for hours, the music continuous. The rest of Stenstrom's 29 sisters had arrived from all over the league, some against Cat and her green gown, some for her, mostly determined by age. The younger sisters were for Cat's redesign, and the elders against it. After one day of dancing, the event officially became an Endurocon, a ball that has no set end. Endurocons were always highly anticipated events in league society, and it didn't take long for the dance to take on a life of its own. Word got out. 
people began showing up to attend in droves, many from Tyrol, many from all corners of Cana and beyond. The Balwigs, wearing their distinctive harsprung pendants, arrived in force like a well-dressed, updoed army. Stenstrom was so proud of Cad as the dance went on, his heart full of love. This was truly her moment to shine in front of the whole family, to prove to his sisters that he had made a splendid choice. Kat's energy was boundless. She danced with him for hours until he could take no more and excused himself from the floor. She then moved on to the children of his sisters, wearing them out and winning them over one at a time. As Kat could not leave the floor to eat or to perform the other unmentionables, Stenstrom fed her by lobbing her bits of food from the buffet line that she would catch out of the air with her teeth. Each toss and catch met with the approval of the many children milling about on the floor. Burla, having to make do with an occasional small handheld plates of food, most certainly did not approve. Many of the sisters had already dropped out of the competition. Sabra, Ione, Linta, Yonia, and Miranda only lasted for an hour or two before leaving the floor to mingle with the other attendees, disqualifying themselves. Stenstrom used a humor that perhaps their laced up, sucked in corsets might have had something to do with their lack of endurance. Calamy hated dancing and just watched. Nylar, Desiree, Elma, Celesta, Salona, and Io, who had begun the dance against Kat, found themselves changing their minds and siding with her by the third day. Burla, still wearing the guise of her mother and fueling herself with various tinctures and potions, was Kat's lone opponent still in play. There were people everywhere enjoying the dance, most giving Kat their seal of approval. Strangers decked out in gowns of all makes and colors were scattered about the floor and dotting the walls. Ladies smoked from woodsy cigarettes offered them by young gentlemen. Stenstrom was certain Professor Sherlamp hadn't given up. Certainly she would try to send assassins into the chalk house, dressed up in all their finery, to have another go at Cat. Though they were wide open, no advanced security system, no cameras, no sensors dotting the grounds, and an event like this would be fertile ground for an attack, Stenstrom wasn't worried. They had protection. Older, sleepless things guarded Belmont Manor. As he mingled with the crowd, he spied a familiar figure standing by the buffet line holding a plate of food. It was a small man wearing a dark blue calvert suit. He was hatless, had short blonde hair combed back away from his face, and wore an odd pair of lenses on his nose. The man gazed across the layers of smoke, out to the ballroom floor, staring at Cat, who was slow dancing with one of Andromeda's sons. He looked at Cat from afar with obvious pride, like a father doting over his daughter. Stenstrom approached the man. Aram! The tiny Aram was all smiles as they embraced, Stenstrom towering over him. Aram had been his friend from the Seeker days, though they had grown apart following Gwen's death. He was one of the people Stenstrom had planned on reconnecting with once Kat was fully settled. It was good to see him. Where have you been, my old friend? he asked. Aram smiled. I've been all over, actually. I'm engaged. I hope to be married soon. Excellent! Congratulations! Are you engaged to anybody I know? Aram thought a moment. No. Well, I hope to be fortunate enough to receive an invitation to your wedding. I know we've grown apart, but I still consider you one of my finest friends. I swear I was going to seek you out. Of course you will. Stenstrom looked about the floor. Is she here, your fiancé? I'd love to congratulate her in person. She's far away right now. But I know she's watching over us in her special way, even at this moment. She didn't want to create a stir. Uh, a stir? That's not quite what I meant. She didn't want to disrupt Kat's concentration. Stenstrom wanted to get Kat's attention and introduce her to him. But Aram balked. Hey, um, if you have a few minutes, I need to have a word with you. I'd like to share a few things, if I may. Sure, in private, please. Aram selected a few more things off the buffet line, and they went out into the night air. The grounds and damp cobbles of the lane lit up in the soft glow of festive lamps. 
faces, both familiar and unfamiliar, bobbed about in the light as they came and went. Nighttime was always peaceful at Belmont Manor, just far enough away from the noise and bustle of Tyrol to be swallowed up by the calm solitude framed by the distant methodical stirrings of the sea. A treasure box of yellow and green stars spilled out in a gentle cascade of twinkling lights. The Belmont Garden stretched off for several maze-like acres, yet another creation of his mother's. Every plant, every hedge turn, every bit of stone carefully planned by Lady Jubilee. For the longest time, the gardens had been deserted, tended daily by the gardeners, but appreciated by nobody. Cat's dance had put a fresh breath of life into the household. People milled about the hedgerows, drinks in hand, seeing all the wonders his mother had intended for them to see. New couples looking for a romantic spot to be alone. Perhaps, in the years to come, they could look back to this evening with nostalgia and say this was the night they fell in love. In the center of the garden were three giant-sized stone urns, again placed there by his mother, representing peace, love, and unity. Under those giant urns, his mother had once plunged a knife into his chest, putting him to the Tyrol blood promise. Peace, love, unity, and a flaming hot knife wielded by a mother's hand. Stenstrom and Aram came into the courtyard. Aram finding a bench to sit down with his plate of food. Stenstrom stood, looking back at the dim lights and white walls of the chalk house, stained windows aflame with movement, seeing colorful, minute shapes of people inside coming and going. He thought he saw Lyra heading out to Marion's Hill, her favorite spot for romance, with some fellow in tow. So before I begin, Belle, I want to tell you how proud we are of both of you. In this matter... You really showed your true colors. What matter? Are you referring to Cat? I am. Many would not have been able to see the potential that lies within, what might be made of it. Many would have turned away from an unkept person from the wild. We knew you would not. We, we told them. Stenstrom was puzzled. How could Aram know such things? Cat was an unknown to League society. None of the stories of how they had met in Clovis had yet come out. Most of his own sisters didn't know, except for Lyra and Virginia. That all might change now that Cat was a countess and a big hit with her dance. But as of yet, Cat was simply another countess from a regular league house. And another thing, who was them? Before Stenstrom could press him for details, Aram continued, I don't have much time, so I'll just cut right to it. Those footprints you saw in the Clovis underground, the footprints in blood... Those were our footprints, mine and my betrothed. Footprints in blood? The gods? Only one conclusion could be drawn. Aram and his betrothed were Cat's angels she so often spoke of. Stenstrom was speechless. Obviously, we have been part of Cat's life for some time, long before she met up with you. We watched over her as she crawled in that terrible black hat dungeon. We wept as she suffered under their lash but were continually uplifted by her simple strength and courage. The black hats were brutal, but Cat's will to endure was stronger, bolstered by a silent inner voice that would not yield. We argued Cat's merits before the gods themselves. We provided her with food, with clothing, with powerful magics, all in the hopes that you would discover her and see her for the person she is. Aram giggled. I, I had to tamper with your autocar a bit to keep you at Clovis a little longer. I erased its memory. Stenstrom thought back. No configuration found, the autocar glyph had said in its pleasing voice. That delay, with the time-consuming task of reconfiguring the control glyph, with having to re-enter and repay for everything, had given Cat time to pitch an argument to him, one that was ultimately successful. What do you want? I want revenge! Aram and his lady, whoever she was, had made that possible. Stenstrom wavered between shock, disbelief, and a passing prickly feeling of anger that his life had been somehow manipulated and pre-chosen for him. 
For a moment, he wondered what he should do, embrace Aram or fly into a rage and chase him from the grounds. A muffled cheer rose up in the distant glow of the chalk house by the lane. He heard the dim sounds of clapping coming from within. Revenge. What of revenge? He hadn't thought of it in some time, had pushed it from his thoughts. All that unpleasantness, all that sadness, gone. Cat had taken all that from him. Cat was the medicine he had needed to continue with his life. His beloved cat was back there in the chalk house, dancing for five days straight to appease his sisters when she didn't have to. Cat, a girl from the Black Hat's dungeon. Cat, who somehow was watched over and guided to him by Aram, his old distant friend. Aram's footprints in the blood at Clovis kneeling over the fallen cat, guarding her life. The anger quickly faded, replaced by curiosity and the warm thump of gratitude that this lovely evening with all his sister's presence was due to Aram and his fiancée. He burned with curiosity. Where to begin? What to ask? Well, I'm listening, he said, presenting an even bearing. Go on, Aram, continue. Aram struggled a bit, deciding where to begin. I don't have a lot of time tonight, Belle. There's so much to tell you, and if you're harboring any notion that we somehow predetermined your path, let me allay your concerns. We might have helped set the table, but you and Cat played it out on your own. He rubbed his forehead. Now then, you of course recall a lady named Hannah Ben Sherlamp? Yes, Professor Sherlamp. How could I forget? How do you know her? Oh, I know her, that's for certain. Not directly, of course, but still, I've seen plenty of her. In all these places we've been, she is always the most unchanged. Yet her role always varies the most, wildly so. Sometimes she helps, other times she's a pain in the rear. In any event, the professor spoke with you about odd things, didn't she? About the old gods and the infinite nature of the universe. Professor Sherlamp was correct about most things. She discussed with you the topic of extraplanar entities, or EPEs as she called them, beings from other universes. She did, and I had little idea what to make of it. She was again correct. Extraplanar entities do exist, though she was spectacularly incorrect on several points. He looked down at his coat and brushed the fabric with his hand. At this moment, I am an EPE, technically. I am Josephus, 7th Lord of Aram. I grew up in Calvert, in the city of St. Edmunds, and I flew with you on the Seeker. But please believe me when I tell you, I'm not the Aram you know and served with. I serve a different Lord Belmont. Where I come from, the Seeker still exists. It still soars to heavens, and you are still its captain, with Lady Gwendolyn, well and alive, at your side. At this moment, I'm a Volgrum, a, a person from another universe, a different reality or plane of being. Perhaps the professor could explain it better. The Aram you know is probably back at the fleet in Armenelos right now, in the mailroom, or possibly the Admiral's office. Aram studied Stenstrom. Do you believe me? Are you comfortable with this notion? Do I believe you? Am I comfortable? Comfortable really isn't a good word for this situation, is it? You seem to know things you couldn't possibly know. So what choice do I have? Besides, I've never known you to be a dishonest, insane, or imaginative storyteller. Hayram lit up and laughed. That's true. It certainly is. That does seem to transcend the universes, doesn't it? When I become a father, Alesta will have to do the storytelling for our children. I'm not so good at it. Stenstrom rubbed his chin. Alesta, is, is that your betrothed's name? It is. She is a pilgrim of Marion. It's a beautiful name. And she's a Marion as well. Perhaps that's why Cat favors the color green so much. Marion green. You're doing fine. Please continue. Aram finished his plate of food and set it aside. So not long ago, though it seems like it's been a lifetime, Alesta and I were approached to go on a bizarre adventure, pulled from our bed in the middle of the night. We were told you needed our help, you needed guidance, and we were to provide you with that guidance. We love you, Belle, we couldn't say no. So off we went, 
this adventure has taken us far away to unseen places far from the league. When I think back on it, it all seems like a dream, standing in places no leaguer has stood in thousands of years, with Alesta at my side. Seeing wonders I find difficult to describe, and we've not just traveled from one place to another, we have spanned the universes, like one might cross an ocean. I have, to date, had the honor of guiding five other versions of yourself as we venture farther away from our home universe. Things get a little stranger every time. In, in one universe, you happen to be a woman, Belle, a tiny, comely woman. That was, uh, that was remarkable, to say the least. Alesta and I have put our marriage on hold until we finish this adventure. Stenstrom is full of questions. Well, I appreciate that. First off, who put you to this task and why? I've been asked that question by you five different times already, and each time my answer is a little bit different as I learn more. We were put to this task by a woman claiming to be your wife. She isn't Gwendolyn or Kat or anybody else we recognize. She's a tall elegant woman wearing a flight suit and a gun. Until recently, we had no name to call her. We, we simply referred to her as the woman with the gun. Though it might sound odd, when in her presence, it doesn't really occur to you to ask her name. Names seem pointless and unnecessary. She sometimes doesn't seem like an ordinary person. She seems more like a presence, if that makes any sense. She told us in an alternate universe that she is your wife and that she lost you across time and space and that she needed us to help return you to her. And you believe this woman? Again, you have to spend a little time with her to understand. She radiates goodness, truth, and a bit of sadness as well. Though her story was improbable at many turns, everything she told has turned out to be true. Alesta always suspected there was a bit more to her than what she let on, that she might not be completely human, and that was proved recently. How so? Aram shrugged, struggling to adequately answer. I saw her standing as an ageless giant in camera her head breaking the clouds in a wondrous sky. In any event, the goal of our adventure was, and is, to guide eight versions of you through performing a series of tasks. When the tasks are complete, our work is done, and we shall return to our universe and be married. And you shall be reunited with the woman with the gun. Not you, an alternate version of you will be reunited, if that makes sense. I believe we're going to need a lengthier session to sort all this out possibly seated with full bellies and a few stiff drinks in hand. What are these tasks I'm supposed to be doing? They mostly center on a device called the anatameter. Aram studied Stenstrom's face. You remember the anatameter, right? Anatameter. Placed in Clovis. Lost in Clovis. Stolen by a demon. The anatameter, it doesn't look like much, but it's an incredibly potent arcane device created by gods. Between every universe is a threshold known as the Hall of Mirrors. If you wish to traverse the plains, then you have to first cross through the hall. Alesta and I have been through it many times. Anatameters act as a lock, preventing most from passing. But in some cases, anatameters may be created for specific people. The one that was given to you by Queen Wendell Knight was just such a case. The woman with the gun partitioned the gods of Camera, and they created one designed for you. What it does is alter fate or divine providence, something to that effect. When the knob is turned by seven different versions of you, then the situation will be ripe for the woman with the gun to be reunited with a new version of you. That's what we've been told. But I lost it in Clovis. The vile creature that killed Gwen stole it. More clapping from the chalk house. People, gowned, colorful like jelly beans, filed out into the night air. Aram stood. I know, and it's of critical importance that we retrieve it. I'm not exaggerating when I say that. We must retake control of it. A tiny blonde-headed form in green wobbled out, greeted by more clapping. The figure made its way into the garden. It was Cat, a bit disheveled after five days of dancing, carrying her shoes. Gee, she called. Where are you? Aram's eyes grew wide. 
I don't want Kat seeing me tonight. She's been dancing for days. She's exhausted. She believes I'm a, a god or an angel or whatever. Seeing me might be too much of a shock for her. Alesta and I will return in four days at the top of Marion's Hill. We will reveal ourselves to her at that time when she's rested. Then I hope you will be ready to hear our guidance and get the anatometer back as soon as possible. Much rides on that. I hope you will heed me. I look forward to meeting this Lady Alesta. And she you. I must go. He headed farther back into the hedges. Four days, Belle. Just then, Cat entered the courtyard. Gee, she exclaimed on seeing him. She came up fast and threw her arms around him. I won, Gee. Burla gave up. She even let her weird dead mother disguise go. She's really pretty without the disguise. She embraced me, said I'd earned her respect, and was headed straight to bed. She looked really tired. I'll bet. I've made so many friends. All your sisters are unbelievable. What are you doing out here in the dark? Just talking to an old friend. Cat looked around. Oh, a friend? Where'd he go? Aram and his betrothed were Cat's angels. We don't want to create a stir, Aram had said. Aram was gone. Stenstrom saw a bit of fog rolling away to the north. I'm sure he's around somewhere. Cat leaned back and gave a prodigious jaw-popping yawn. Oh, I'm so tired. Take me to bed, G. I could sleep for a week. Arm in arm, they made their slow way out of the gardens, towards the manor. So how did you manage to go five days without visiting the bathroom, he asked. Lady, secret, G. You know, I danced with every one of Antonia's sons. I don't remember how many. And then you know what I did? What, Cat? I danced with her daughters, too. She has a lot of kids. She certainly does. His heart full of love for Kat, Stenstrom took her to bed. She too tired to complain about the mattress. He would worry about gods and demons and anatometers later. And with that, we conclude part four, chapter one, an old friend at the ball. This is obviously a segue chapter that I created just to usher in the final part of the book. It was the best way I could think of to bridge the previous part with this one. So Aram reintroduced himself to Lord Belmont and put his cards on the table. It was what he had to say was weird and kind of strange to listen to, but he, he knew enough that Stenstrom couldn't just write him off out of hand. In four days, he plans to return and tell all to both Stenstrom and Cat. He needs to get off his duff and go get the anatometer, and we know where it is. It's with the demon in blue lights in her horror realm that she's creating. That chapter was indeed a segue to the rest of the book. Next chapter, chapter two, The Hall of Mirrors, and we proceed with the quest to get to the demons with blue lights and recover the anatometer and have revenge on the demon. In the, this chapter, I figured, you know, sometimes little things make a big deal. In my family, little things have led to big fights and feuds and hurt feelings. And I figured the whole dress thing would really create a buzz in a bad way with the families. His sisters, some of them would be outraged, while some of them would be okay with it. In any event, I figured that Kat would want to show his sisters respect, even though she wasn't getting a whole lot in return. That's just the sort of person she is. So, next week we continue Chapter 2, The Hall of Mirrors, and the quest for the anatometer begins in earnest. And we'll see what you think of some of my choices as Kat needs her power back. Otherwise, these two are going to die. Anyways, this is Ren Presents. I'm your host, Ren. Peace out.